Welcome to today's webinar. I would like to hand over the floor to Ms. Faiza Musa, who is going to be our moderator for the session, and so that she can introduce the panelists today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, okay, my name is Faiza Musa. Uh, I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, <clears throat> a, a certified professional mediator, and I work at the Kenya National Commission of Human Rights. I'm addressing you from Mombasa. I welcome you all to today's webinar on electoral dispute resolution in East Africa. And uh, I welcome all from the East African region, that is Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and uh, the newly joined team from Congo. So today we are going to have a panel of four, pan four speakers. <coughs> that is uh, Dr. D that is Mr. Advocate Omwanza Ombati, uh, Advocate <coughs> Moses Kipkoge. Uh, we are still waiting for a panelist for, from Tanzania, Dr. Rugemeleza, to join us, and Advocate Kiza from Uganda. So when they join us, then we can be able to, to introduce them to the team. So. <coughs> Karibu sana daktari. <clears throat> At least I think we have the we can start because we have a total of 46 participants who have joined us. So karibu sana to today's webinar. <clears throat> so I can go ahead introducing the participants to, to the team. I can start with uh, I can start with Mr. Advocate Omwanza, <coughs> who is a partner at Nchogu Omwanza and Yasimi Advocates. And he has been in the profession for more than 18 years. He holds a, an LLB from Moore University <coughs> and an LLM from Cambridge University in the UK. He also has a rich uh, professional background, which will, will be of, ben of benefit to us young lawyers as we are going to discuss this topic today. Uh, the second one, I'll go to Moses Kipkoge, <coughs> who is a partner at GA <coughs> Advocates LLP, and he also has an illustrious career, who has garnered wealth uh, experience and knowledge in diverse field of law, including constitution, constitutional law, litigation, and uh, human rights enforcement, environmental law, and negotiating and drafting construction contracts. He also he, he holds a bachelor's of law degree from Moy University and a postgraduate diploma from the Kenya School of Law. In addition, he's a governance expert, having been certified by the Kenya School of Government and has played an integral role in the formulation of both corporate and national policies on a wide spectrum of issues. So in expertise, he has participated in developing the law reform policy framework for the commission which informed amendments to the Elections Act <coughs> and host of other electoral laws, uh, conceptualized and drafted the elections technology regulations, among other regulations, and participated in conceptualizing and formulating the draft regulations under the Election Campaign Financing Act, among others. So he's a member of the Law Society of Kenya, just as a, <coughs> a member of the Chartered Institute of Budgeters and member of the International Dispute Resolution Center. So among others, he also has a rich, uh, a rich uh, professional background that will be beneficial to us young lawyers. I'll, I'll move to, I've seen Dr. Rugemeleza has joined us. And uh, I think he's the, he's the, uh, what term can I use? Because uh, if you look at uh, Dr. Rugemeleza's pro professional background, he has a rich background based on the fact that he's the eldest among us all. So he holds a Master's of Environmental Management from Yale School of Forestry. He holds a Master's of Law from Harvard Law School. 
He holds a bachelor's of law degree from the University of Dar es Salaam. So professionally, he's uh, the former chair, former president of the Tanganyika Law Society. He has been the chairperson of board of directors Tanzania Land Alliance, a legal coalition of Tanzanians land related CSOs. Uh, December 2015 to date. He also the executive director lawyers environmental action plan, a public interest environmental law organization in Dar es Salaam, the managing partner of Rugu Meleza and Shala advocates, legal consultants in Tanzania. So he has a continuous legal uh, education trainer oil, gas, minerals, legal regimes, Law Society of Kenya 2014. He's also a lecturer, the Regional Extractive Industry Knowledge Hub, Second Summer School of Governance in Oil, Gas and Mining Revenues, Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. He has taught also international environmental law, extractive industry, climate change and state obligation under current international law. He, he has also been a lecturer at the Extractive Industry Capacity Building Training Workshop in Tanzania, organized by Publish What You Pay Coalition in Tanzania. He has also been a lecturer on uh, the Regional Extractive Industries Knowledge Hub, Second Summer School Governance in Oil Gas. So he's also a Human Rights Fellow. He has also been a President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Environment Action Team. So you go on and on he has a rich a very rich he has a very rich uh, professional background that will be totally beneficial to all of us uh, so i see doc I, uh, I i thank you all for joining us i see uh, advocate aaron has joined but he seems to be on transit so i can go ahead and introduce him though i see he's still driving uh kiza aaron Okay, is the co-founder and the managing partner of uh, Kiza Musinga, uh, Kiza Mungisha and uh, advocates in Uganda. He holds a bachelor's of law degree from Uganda Christian University, a postgraduate diploma in legal practice from Law Development Center, Kampala. Mr. Aaron has also attended specialist courses at the University of Pretoria, Uganda Matthias University, the Media Legal Defense Initiative, 2015 USA, USA International Visitor Leadership Program, the 2018 Internet Governance Forum, the 2019 Stockholm Internet Forum, and several continuous legal education programs. He's an advocate of the High Court of Uganda, a member of the Uganda Law Society and the East Africa Law Society. Aaron is currently serving as member of the Uganda Law Society Rule of Law Committee and Human Rights Cluster and the Advisory Committee of Network for Public Interest Lawyers. Alongside learning, Aaron is also a published writer and performance poet. So I welcome you all to today's uh, today's webinar. Will be I'll have your time from two to four. So I'll be your moderator for today, and uh, we are going to take the discussion approach on the election dispute resolution in East Africa. And focus on the Supreme Court. Uh, on the Supreme Court of Kenya, as you all know, the judgment came out. Uh, on the presidential election, and there are also subsequent uh, petitions that are being currently filed in different areas in Kenya. So I welcome you all to have a robust discussion, open your minds, and uh, we can have a fruitful discussion. So for the house rules, anybody who has any question, you can type in in the chat section, then you can be able to pick it up with the, with the speakers, and they, are, they can be able to answer the team so karibuni sana from wherever you are it's an afternoon in mombasa it's a sunny day in mombasa and i hope all of you are, are feeling great today so we can proceed eh? i guess i'm i'm loud enough yes you are yes you are loud enough so we can start with the, the drafting, the motivation for filing election petitions. I'll welcome comments from uh, the speakers. So we'll start with the motivation for filing of election petitions. 
because you, we all know that uh, uh, there is always a winner and a loser, and whenever the 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 loser doesn't is aggrieved by the decision, then by the the results, then he is able to file a petition in court. So we can start with the motivation of filing election petitions. I therefore welcome first Mr. Omwanza to comment on that, and then we can move to the other speakers. Kalibu, Mr. Omwanza. Thank you, Faiza. Uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, it's a pleasure again to meet you, albeit on online, to discuss this very important topic, particularly after our general elections and uh, in view of maybe some imminent or impending election petitions. Uh, from my experience, uh, I would uh, summarize the motivation for filing uh, election petitions uh, into about five points. The first is that uh, politicians move their political competition from the political podium to the comfort of a courtroom. For those of us who followed the presidential petition, you would see that you know half of it, maybe 50% of it was legal and 50% was political. So it is that extension of that political debate, uh, I think as part of closure uh, in these uh, contestations. The second is because of uh, managing expectations by politicians to angry supporters after sometimes a devastating loss. My view, and I could be wrong, you'd see this mostly in terms of uh, high profile elections, especially for president and governor, whereby you know candidates and their supporters are totally invested in the process and maybe have high expectations of their candidates. And wherever they lose, it's not easy for a politician as a single individual to be able to manage the, uh, their uh, supporters without having a sort of outlet. So I think the second reason that uh, people file petitions is because of that, to manage expectations. The third one is to undermine the political and legal legitimacy of the winner, uh, possibly for the next election contest that would uh, come maybe after five years, or if the petition succeeds, uh, then uh, the legitimacy of the person who would won in the election which was contested has, uh, has been already been undermined. The last one, the, the fourth one is, I think, spite. I mean, out of human competition, people sometimes have feelings about how a process has been conducted. And then, uh, you know, out of spite, they probably don't feel like they, maybe the winner deserved to win. So that is one of the other uh, reasons. The fifth one is negotiation, post-election negotiation, negotiation. And I saw this in context to the in context to the Kenyan uh, elections. You'd find, for instance, uh, in the last election cycle, that is a 2017, some of the petitions that are filed uh, were used as a platform or rather as an arm's length negotiation for politicians to use to negotiate for other political positions with the winners or the government that was in place. And lastly, obviously, from the numbers that you're able to de uh, deduce from uh, the petitions that have succeeded, there are also those who genuinely have grievances that wish to present to court so that they are uh, settled or adjudicated and then uh, and that matter is put to rest. So that, that is my take in the motivations of uh, why people file petitions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mwanza. Uh, if you have any question or for him, then you can type in the chat, chat section. I welcome Mr. Kip Koge to also comment on the motivation for filing uh, election petitions. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Faisa. And uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Um, I think uh, I, would, I would just go straight to answer that question. Um, and I, by and large, I agree with uh, my colleague, Mr. Omwanza, on the reasons uh, why or what motivates politicians to 
seek uh, to challenge uh, elections outcomes. But I would, speaking for myself, I would cluster them into two. Um, there are those, and, and these are the majority, they, they file petitions because um, they do not have, they do not really have a genuine grievance, but they, they are just filing them to um, postpone the, you know, the battle. So it's, it's another stage in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the matrix, in the engagement, the political engagement. So many of those, and I would put it at 95% of all the cases filed in court fall into that category. Um, politicians are using the court as, um, as an avenue to uh, politicize or judicialize their political issues. Uh, the remaining 5%, I would put them as those who have genuine grievances, the electoral commission may have moved or the other candidate may have, um, may have uh, really um, engaged in dirty campaigns or some other election malpractice. I would put it at slightly a small number 25 percent and that is uh, born out of the data if you look at the data uh, generated by the at least in kenya the electoral commission iebc you will find around 93 percent of the disputes end up being dismissed by the courts either struck out because of uh, one procedural irregularity or the other or even on the merits they end up being dismissed so um, that points out to the fact that um most of the disputes presented in court are not genuine. They do not present genuine grievances, but they are presented to pacify supporters, to uh, deal with, or what uh, um, Omanta describes as out of spite against the other candidate or to, as a leverage for negotiating. Either way, it's really, it's, it, they do not present genuine grievances. But 5%, maybe probably 6%, actually present a genuine grievance and those are the ones which the court would adjudicate upon and you find uh, an annulment being uh, being the being the remedy um so really without much ado i think those would be my comments on that area um and for advocates who then have to bear the burden of drafting papers knowing that a complaint is not is not genuine it's, it's a bit interesting i should hear from i have not drafted one i have defended <laughs> so okay Thank you, thank you, thank you, Faiza. Thank you, Mr. Kipkoge. I guess we'll hear to, from some of them who have drafted some of the petitions, uh, the experience so far. So we can move to Dr. Rugemeleza from uh, Tanzania. Karibu, Daktari. You can comment on the motivation for filing election petitions. Perhaps Dr. can put his mic on. I think he has dropped off. No, he's oh, actually yeah. on, but uh, he's on. He's on. He's on. He's on. Mike, his mic is Your mic is off. You're welcome, Dr. Ali. He seems to be submitting. Kindly, and, and your volume is low. Maybe you can check your sound system. It's still low. Doctor, you kindly check your sound. Um, Aiza, are you able to do it from the side? Uh, no, it, it's unmuted. I, I think it's uh, yes. Maybe we can move to the next speaker as Dr. Tari sorts out his. <coughs> yeah, we can move to Mr. Aaron as Dr. Tari sorts out his his machine. 
Okay, thank you very much. I am no longer moving. I've parked and I will choose the venue as my car. So don't say that he's on the move. Um, okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So I agree with the recurrent speakers, as we used to say in the school debates. I will add the, just some language. Uh, first, the, the first motivation is political. They are political motivations. Um, so the drama, as the first speaker says, shifts from the political field to the court theater. And uh, you have some peak, peak, peak moments. You have uh, a lot of drama in court at the highest level, at the highest level of the judiciary. And <clears throat> a politician is a fighter. They have to fight where there is a space. They have to occupy all space and they have to exhaust all motives. If it be in court, if it be in media, even after court, you will, you will be sure that the battle from the, the, the ballot to the court, now it goes to the media and it, it will continue. The, the politician never stops fighting. So they will occupy every space that presents before them, power, it's a virtue. The other motivation is legal. And that's where they are saying that the grounds might be there. Yes. So the legal, mo the, 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 once they are legal grounds, for example, Barot staffing, if there are electoral crimes that have been committed, like bribery, like fraud, and so on and so forth, and they are, someone believes it, then they have to put it to the court to test. So those are the legal motivation. But there is another motivation called what I've called for the record. Some people call it for posterity. Sometimes people go to courts, not just because they not even not because they believe in the courts, not because of politics, but to put the record so that people know that after all my participation in this electoral process, what was the record? Why didn't I win? Where will they find it? If you, for example, in Uganda, you go for 2011, 2001, 2006, you look at the judgment, you get a sense of what the battle was, what the issue is, and the fact that there were many mild practices, although the, 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 the election itself was not annulled. And then, of course, there is a faith in the judicial system. You can be sure if that people don't have faith in the judicial system, you will not see them in the courts. And if they go into the courts, it will be for other reasons. But for instance, in the Kenyan case, people have faith in the judiciary and they go there to assert their rights, assert their interests. But we should also know and that's also another point is that the existence of that right, because you don't just go to court, there must be a right to go to court. In Tanzania, I'm well informed, there's no such a right to go to court if you lose a presidential election. You go to your God and you cry. Uh, Orimango put it dramatically. Was it Orimango or Obo, one of the writers put it dramatically? You cry on the shoulders of either your wife or your children. Yeah, if you had consulted the witchcraft, you go to demand for a refund and they will not give it. That is in our local language called potea. You, it is foregone. There is no refund in corruption or, 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 or such cases. So the very existence of the right petition alone can be a motivation for a candidate who has lost a presidential election to exercise that right to go to court and complain and put and involve the judiciary and the legal minds of the day. Uh, because it must never be taken for granted. In East Africa, we are very sure that it exists, that right exists. Um, at least it's not in Tanzania. Maybe in other East African countries, it's there. So if you're a Tanzanian and you're a presidential uh, 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 candidate and you lose, you don't go to the Supreme Court, you don't challenge that, that, uh, that, that victory because you have no such a right. So those are the motivations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. Uh, uh, so far, we have captured that uh, one is political, the other is legal, and uh, Mr. Aaron has just added that you have to have the the right, uh, like you have to be supported by law that you have that right to file a, a petition. I see that Dr. Rugemeleza is back. We can welcome him to comment on the same. Dr. Karibu.
Doctor, you, you still cannot be heard. Doctor, you are still not audible. Uh, we, we cannot still uh, get you. Uh, I don't know what the problem is. Doctor, you kindly check your machine. We cannot get you. Maybe Doctor, we can log off, then you log back in okay. again. Let's just be patient as we wait for him to log in in a few. Pfizer, I suggest. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can move to the next uh, question so that when, when Dr. Tari is properly technologized, we will still give him the opportunity to address the issue. Oh, okay. but we can, no. for, the, for the sake of time, we can move to the next question. Oh, okay. Please, uh, take note of the new word, technologized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have done so. So we can move to the next discussion area. Uh, I guess we have exhausted. In case you have any query, kindly put them in the chat section. You can be able to pick it up. So we can move to the complaint against the elections. And uh, well, we can uh, start by the first uh, speaker, Mr. Mwanza, to comment on the same. Uh, th thank you, Faiza. The, the complaints about the an election are, are varied. I would uh, specifically speak about the complaints that you can <clears throat> lodge in the Kenyan courts, because that is where my experience is uh, best. And I think you start with uh, what the Supreme Court has been able to delineate as qualitative complaints. So these are complaints that go to the process of the election. For instance, um, you know, the forms were not signed or uh, the people voted, you know, at, at 2 a.m. in the morning after close of the, of, of, of the polls. That is now the qualitative. Now, the, then, then we have a second set, set of complaints. This is what you call quantitative. These are complaints that are based on the numbers that have been uh, achieved, particularly by the winning candidate. So that for you to be able to overcome a return election, you need to you need to meet the quantitative test. You need to challenge the numbers between the person who has won and the second runners up or the runners up. So that is now the quantitative test. So this will be mostly based on the law uh, uh, with regard to the elections, and they would be based also on the constitution. In Kenya, we have Article 81 and 86, which set up the broad principles that are applicable in terms of the electoral process. And then we have the Elections Act and many, many other pieces of legislation. The third uh, category of complaints will be complaints uh, on uh, bordering on, uh, on, on uh, criminality, particularly by agents of the candidates and also by the candidates themselves. Uh, this will be, for instance, on election violence, 
uh, witchcraft, what my friend from Uganda, Eric, uh, spoke about witchcraft. We've had two or three interesting cases in Kenya where witchcraft was one of the complaints which was uh, which had been proved. And I remember in the last circle also there was a there was a witchcraft uh, complaint in Narok which succeeded in a, a member of uh, county assembly. Then the fourth ca category, which I have not seen, but I think which probably would be coming, and I've seen this from mostly from the Indian cases, are complaints about election finance. So I would categorize them into those four broad principles. And obviously, you need now to know the test of, of overturning an election under our law, it will be Section 83 of the Elections Act. Uh, this is the old test of Morgan versus Simpson. I think I'll leave it to that and then I'll wait for, uh, for, for the questions. But, but there is an interesting case probably that uh, Eric knows. It's the case of Businge versus uh, Kitende. Uh, this is what we call now the, the, other, the other fifth test, now the materiality. And the court said that for the court to decide whether non-compliance affected the result in a substantial manner, it must be proved to its satisfaction that the non-compliance was calculated to really influence the result in a significant manner. And then the court has to evaluate the whole process of the election and determine the degree and effect. Thank you for that, for the time that you've given. Thank you, Mr. Mwanza. Uh, I'll just share the, the, the case uh, details so that you can be able to re go through it at your own time. So I welcome Mr. Kipkoge, comment on the same. Okay, thank you, thank you, Faiza. Um, uh, the, the, the complaints which can be presented in an election petition can be, um, they are as far as the legal regime of the country concerned co um, relates to. Um, I can give the example of Kenya. We have, uh, um, complaints which relate to the pre-election mm -hmm. period, complaints which are targeted at the electoral management body in relation to the manner in which it has handled the pre-poll um, uh, issues. For instance, the manner in which it has compiled the register of voters, the manner in which it has registered uh, candidates to participate in the election, for instance, and qualified candidates who may have participated in the election, um, and qualifications are set out in the law. For instance, in Kenya, you have a governor candidate, for instance, who may not have the degree qualifications, for instance, it becomes a substantial question. Um, you would find uh, issues relating with um, the manner in which campaigns has been regulated by the election, election management body or the candidate who has won, who perhaps might have participated in um, what um, a judge described as unfair campaigns. I think it was the case of uh, the governor of Kisumu um, in 2013 season in Kenya. Um, others would relate to what happened on polling day. Um, and that is in relation to whether or not polls opened on time and the potential impact it had on the election or it was closed before time or the, the requisite number of hours was not accorded to voters to vote, um, whether there were errors in uh, the election materials. Um, I've seen cases where ballot papers have wrong images and the court has to look at it and say probably this confused uh, voters, images of candidates, images of um, uh, supporting parties. Uh, uh, it could also relate to the manner in which uh, counting was done by the presiding officer at the polling station and the aggregation of those uh, results. Um, what the Omwanta has described as the numbers, do, do the numbers add up? So that could be one of the complaints which could be taken up in court. Um, I, I don't know what how Mr. Omwanta would want to characterize the 2017 petitions against the, the now um, exiting president, where uh, one of the accusations was expenditure of state resources um, in campaigns. And I think that goes to campaign financing. So it's not true on, on, on one side that Kenya has not experienced it. We have had one where 
an issue of that nature was raised. And I think the court affirmed the fact that it can address issues of uh, expenditure of state resources and campaign financing to, um, a, li to a little extent. Um, for instance, foreign funding is not allowed in Kenyan law. So if you are to finance, if a foreigner was to finance a, a candidate in Kenya, it could easily be a ground for an element of, of, of elections, of their election. Um, and declared use of state resources. If you are a governor and you're using official vehicles and you don't declare to the election management body um, under section, I think 14 of the Election Offenses Act, then that would be a ground for annulment of that election. Uh, now the favorite for Kenyans is uh, technology. Did the technology work? Did it transmit results? Was it what identification uh, identification of voters um, uh, proper in accordance with the uh, applicable regulations, I believe regulation 69 of the uh, uh, general elections, general regulations and the IEBC uh, elections um, technology regulations. Um, did it work? Did it um, yield what was supposed to yield? Were voters identified properly? and did the transition from the use of technology to manual processes uh, comply with the law um, and for presidential elections transmission of results so those are some of the grounds which uh, could be presented in an election petition um, if, if, if the litigation we are dealing with is a kenyan one it would be important to um, confirm that the law you are applying relates to or applies to that concerned election i remember in 2017 um quite a number of uh, advocates filed petitions challenging mca or member of the national assembly the senate without noticing that uh, the law on transmission was only applicable to the presidential election so a number of petitions were filed challenging uh, other elective positions um without cross-checking the law and it ended up um uh, being dismissed by the courts because the law was not applicable. That law was not applicable to such elections. So uh, I think I will stop there. Uh, thank you, Vesa. Thank you so much, Moses. Mr. Moses, uh, I can welcome Mr. Aaron to comment on the same. Mr. Aaron. Thank you. Had had anything to add? But uh, to say that I agree. And they comment that um, one of the types of petitions is the issue presents itself in many shapes and sizes. As the recent petition also showed, a possible component could be one of water suppression but the standards uh, are also spelled out in the judgment of the Supreme Court. So if it happens, which it rarely happens, but um, it happens in other electoral jurisdictions, like even in the USA, due to gerrymandering, to exclude in some states where it is extreme, some racial communities to suppress their votes. So voter suppression can actually happen. Gerrymandering sometimes happens in East Africa and it could lead to that. But the stand, but it's not something easy to prove. There are complaints that relate to harassment. Legally, it presents itself as intimidation. Now, intimidation can lead to harassment, can lead to human rights violations, things around that, uh, tear gassing, uh, opponent supporters. It's not very much common in Kenya, but in Uganda, those things can actually happen at the presidential, even at the parliamentary levels. Um, then there are issues that uh, relate to, I can relate to that one, to military or police zealous involvement in the in elections. Where that happens, then the candidate can frame grounds on that and they adduce evidence to show that because of military involvement, that would of course augment intimidation and so on and so forth just comment also that the electoral offense of bribery also has implications on what they called uh, ele election finance 
although it is normally local, but it could be that the bribery, the electoral bribery is actually financed. from abroad, but whether it is locally, so money used for bribery is a, 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 a subvert the will of the population. So the grants can spring from electoral law, normally the substantive electoral law, uh, you normally have election, uh, pre parliamentary elections act, presidential elections act, in the case of president, but also constitutional infringements can give cause for complaints in an electoral court. So that's how I would want to frame it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Aaron. Uh, I see the comment section is still dormant on, uh, uh, as far as now, uh, basing on the two discussions that have been made. I urge you to ask your questions. The panelists are here. They have catered time for us. In case you have any uh, two discussions, just type it in at the chat section, then you can be able to pick it up. So I, I request to move to the to the next part. We are just highlighting some of the key things in an election petition. I see Dr. Nshala is back. I, I don't know if he has fixed, then we can uh, start from there. Uh, uh, hello, hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, so basically, for me, what I, what I think is important that uh, people go to court because I think they have genuine grievances, or perhaps uh, what what took place, or the, the entire electoral practice or process was uh, was disrupted or was corrupted, and uh, one has no any other alternative but rather to go to court to vindicate his or her right. And uh, as the previous speaker said, in Tanzania, for example, here, by virtue of Article uh, 46, uh, Capital A of our constitution, you cannot uh, uh, challenge the, uh, the presidential results. So the adage that uh, uh, the most important person in an election is not the voter, but rather the one who counts the, the vote. In Tanzania, it's the best guy, uh, the most important person is the one who uh, pronounce, or announces the, the results. So last in 2020, for example, even in parliamentary elections were not challenged simply because people had lost faith in the, in the, 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 the judicial, uh, the judiciary in, the, in that uh, uh, many cases, uh, if, if they are taken to court there, the chance of winning were almost to zero because the threshold or the, the burden of proof is so high. You are supposed to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. And most of the documents or the, the, the evidence that you need to uh, uh, provide to the court uh, are basically within the, the, the possession of the electoral body, which is not compelled even to bring those, uh, those, uh, those documents before the course of law. And again, the entire pro electoral process was basically uh, it was run and I say whatever whatever you do, we are going to announce the winner. The former president had said the returning officers in K who are also district executive directors, if they are going to uh, announce that the, the the opposition candidate has won, they will lose their their jobs. So it was basically. Uh, 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 a charade that uh, whoever uh, you just take, took part in the, that electoral process basically to fulfill the, the consumer requirement that elections have to be held after five years, but in, in the entire election process was a fraud. So even if you go to court, what are you going to challenge? Okay, you might challenge the, the results and everything that took place, but uh, uh, you'll go still go back to the same uh, uh, national ele election for, uh, uh, commission, which is going to still uh, uh, declare the, the winner from the from the ruling party. So, uh, if you are if if you are saying you are going to court, going to court is important in those countries where uh, the the the, judici the judiciary is independent. And the decisions of, of the of the judiciary are going to be uh, respected by each and, and, and everyone. It's important that if you are if you are a country that believes in the rule of law, 
then you allow people to be able to go to court. And whoever goes to court should not be seen as, as some people have said, they're going there out of spite. There's, there's going to be a number of people who go out of spite, but not many. But that assurance must be there because it makes each and every participant know that if we misbehave or if we go and, uh, and not, do not follow the, 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 the procedures or we violate the, 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 the laws, eventually we'll be taken to court. So at least all the, all the, the participants know that ultimately the, the courts of, of, of law will have their, their hands on the documents, on all that, all the things that we did, and business basically engenders confidence and compliance. And uh, for that matter, people will be as well. And uh, this ensures that uh, we, we are able to protect the democratic process. And for that matter, we hold the elections to be sacred. And if they are sacred, then for that matter, we will participate in that exercise knowing for sure that we must follow the, the, the law. But if we see these people as people who are not uh, are not uh, are not uh, uh, important, perhaps they are uh, they are motivated by spite, and perhaps is as some people have said, it is a is a, a management of, of expectations or is like a, a, a grieving a problem mechanism. Uh, yes, it might be, but basically for me, I see it as a cornerstone. Uh, as a fundamental right that uh, uh, directorates must be able to exercise in, but in, in order to ensure that uh, our countries are well managed. But if we see those who go to court there as troublemakers, uh, as people that perhaps don't have genuine grievances, then we, are, we might be also not on, on the right side. Yes, we must make sure that our elections are well held because it's a sacrosanct uh, process that assures a, 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 a citizen that his or a, a, a voice matters in electing the people who are supposed to be in the country. But if there are some clever people who use the process or use the, 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 their, their, their positions, manipulate the process, basically we cannot have it. And for me, I see it as a very, very important device to ensure we have good and well run elections. For that matter, we need to have uh, independent uh, election bodies, and uh, those they must discharge their their, their functions properly, and uh, unlike and should not be should, should be free of political intimidations and manipulations. That's what I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daktari, for sharing the experience from Tanzania. Uh, I guess uh, I can I can because there is only one question. I can give it out to any one of the speakers to answer. Uh, Michael has asked what will be the fate of some petitioners advocates who are accused of tendering false evidence and forged documents in court. So I welcome uh, Mr. Mwanza or Mr. Kipkoge to answer that, then we can proceed to the third aspect in election petitions. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Faiza. Let me just give it a try. I know you're going to, I'm sure in this uh, process, we are going to discuss how to deal with the uh, evidence and witnesses. Probably we can discuss it at that point um, so that it is subsumed in, uh, in that space. Um, uh, partly because it is, it is an issue which arose in the recently decided uh, petition probably can subsume it under that. Um, oh. We have our own varied views about it. And I know Mwanza and myself participated in the petition. Um, I think uh, we, can, we can share under a bigger uh, title. OK. Yeah. So thank you for that. We can move to the witnesses to a petition, uh, which is the third aspect. Uh, so we can start with the first uh, speaker to speak about the witnesses in, a pet in an election petition. Mr. Omwanza. Thank you, Faiza. I, I, I always tell people that uh, having gone through these cases, the, the best witness to a petition is the witness who's, who has lost most or who stands to lose the most. Ordinarily, this will be the, the, the runners up or one of the candidates who 
participated in the election. Uh, so that, in my view, I would advise that if you have to file a petition, then that should be your main witness. Uh, secondly, even before I go very far, for those who intend to file petitions in this cycle, you should know that uh, I think time is going to run out by this Friday because uh, the tw 28 days start to run from the date of declaration. So you'll start maybe the first declaration was on 9th, uh, even nine, nine, nine during the night, so the the the, the first day of uh, of of that will be maybe tomorrow. So, and and as we go along, depending on the dates that uh, the election was uh, declared. Secondly, the other material witnesses are witnesses who are agents during the process. So you would find this as the chief agents or the agents who are the polling. Uh, you know, polling clerks, uh, presiding officers. Now, this would be now mostly the ones who are answering, and the returning officer. Those would be the main witnesses during a, a petition. The other category, obviously, would be witnesses who have uh, uh, who are able to witness maybe an election offense, and then uh, you'd have maybe a fourth category of witnesses who would be experts, especially on numbers. This would be statisticians, and then you would have, uh, you know, journalists, you would might have uh, observers, election observers, and that sort of thing. So those would be the main witnesses. And you do not that uh, if you've read the, the, the summarized version or the abridged version of the court of the Supreme Court judgment, in the concluded presidential petition, the court had a lot of to say about witnesses. So witnesses are basically the main foundation of any election petition, and you should be very careful, especially if you are prosecuting. In fact, even if you are defending about the witnesses who you choose, uh, their credibility, and their nexus to the election. Thank you, Mr. Mwanza. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mwanza. Mr. Kipkoge, do you have something to add? I think on, I think uh, just to add on to what Mr. Omanza has uh, uh, spoken about, and probably at, it's at this point we can answer the question raised by one of our colleagues on the platform. Um, there is a, it, it's important for the advocate drawing a petition or even responding to the petition to link the witnesses and the documents which is to be proffered by the witnesses to the burden of proof on what issue are you seeking to prove with that particular witness? Um, and this is particularly in, res in, uh, in relation to those who respond, uh, because there is, there is the danger that you can avail as many witnesses as you want to, but which do not address the issues as framed by the petitioner or which do not answer um, the petition. And for the petitioner, it is to ask yourself, what would I stand to gain by having this witness um, uh, testify or have their witness statement as part of the record? Because um, as someone puts, you, um, you need to ask yourself, what do I gain? What do I stand to gain by having this testimony? What we've seen in court is that uh, most petitions are drafted in a rush. Um, every other uh, witness is collected from the streets, a statement is quickly generated, and then it ends up conflicting with the case theory, which is thought to be propounded by the petitioner. And because most, many of the issues arising in petitions, unless it's a, it, especially when the issues being um, uh, raised in the petition are all of, of a qualitative nature, you know, unfair campaigns, uh, campaigning outside time, um, name calling in the name in, in, during campaigns, uh, issues to do with malpractices generally. Those require witnesses of fact. There is no documentary evidence. So the, the witness must be credible, must be someone who has a, some moral standing in the society, someone who can convince 
because there is also a general tendency by um, especially in Kenya that uh, politicians are liars and those who associate with politicians are not liars. So you are you need the choice of witnesses becomes then a very important thing to consider. So uh, one of the things then as, as, as a lawyer to, when preparing is to ask, what do I stand to gain by having this witness? Um, if you notice for in the recently decided uh, petition, um, one of the, and, and of course, as counsel, avoid testifying for your client. It is easy to say, well, because I need someone credible, then I'm I'm the credible one. So one of the allegations which has been was labeled uh, was directed at one of the advocates who appeared for the parties, and uh, the court did not, um, especially uh, the court noted that some of the material which had been presented by the advocate was not verifiable. In fact, it fell short of being forgeries. And it became worse because it was then being presented by an officer of the court. So again, it, it becomes a, a choice which has to be made with some careful consideration. This was a case where we were talking about forms which uh, were purportedly presented by agents. So the court is asking, why weren't the agents themselves testifying? Where are the witness statements from the agents themselves? and not the advocate. And then, and because now those forms were impugned, then the advocate had to take the flag for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Aaron, you have something to add to the discussion? Well, just to briefly say that if a lawyer engages in criminality, the criminal is there to handle him, including when they are prosecuting electoral matters. So if a lawyer actively facilitate, facilitates forgery and verification of documents, they could find themselves uh, battering perjury charges and uh, fraud charges and so on and so on. They are a return of crimes and offenses you commit when you knowingly engage in misleading court. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. On my part, basically, I'm saying as a lawyer, you should, should always avoid trying to engage into perjury or whichever, uh, trying to mislead the court and uh, so many other things. Basically, state your, your client's case. If you have evidence, ensure that the evidence are set forth before the, the, the court. And for that matter, you're able to enhance your, your credibility and likewise also your, your client's case. And for that matter, if you, if you go and start lying, fabricating things, eventually it will be caught and it will not look good on you. So it's important all the time to ensure that you have credible witnesses and you're also your case is well stated, is backed up by the facts and also by, by the law as it might be re required. So of course the, the bad thing about these election cases, the, the time to for you to prepare the uh, the pleadings is not uh, it's not it's, it's not uh, conducive. So sometimes people end up with uh, exaggerating things and putting up things there, then which they cannot uh, back up. Even like the, the Kenyan case, uh, you are supposed to have you file your case within seven days if if if, if, if I'm right. Then uh, if you are, if you are challenging the, uh, the the election process for the entire country, but you are you are in trouble to be able to come up with a with a, a well stated and backed up case. So perhaps uh, some short that particular score. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess uh, people are still uh, concentrating. So I hope you have noted the, the what the speakers have shared. They avoid they avoid perjury as a as an advocate. Ensure that the case is backed up by law. Ensure that the the witnesses are credible. So I. In case of any question, you can type in the Q and A session in the Q and A chat. Then we can be able to answer where you have not understand. You have never you have not understood. Then we can be able to get it up from there. So we can move to the critical part in election petitions, and that's the pleadings. Uh, we always have that timeline uh, that uh, people is people are always on the rush to ensure that they are not limited by. They are limited. They're not li limited by the time frame that has been set by the law. So pleadings is a critical area, and uh, I urge my speakers to 
really share their experiences too uh, as seniors to, to us and uh, therefore I welcome uh, we can now start with Mr. Mr. Aaron, then we can move to the next one to comment on the pleadings. Then we can go to Mr. I may, I beg your pardon. Mwanza and move to the next one. No, I beg your pardon. What do you want me to comment on? On the pleadings, uh, okay. like uh, the election petition generally needs a uh, documentations, pros, uh, and the, the drafting of all that, and due to the time frame, so I just want you to comment on the pleadings that are the election petitions. <clears throat> um, the pleadings are very important because that's where you have to state the remedies. If you don't state the remedies in your pleadings, you don't have a case, you don't have a cause of action. That's why you indicate the party, the person you're suing, and that's where you put the cause of action, the reason why you're in court and the grounds. The pleadings must be very pithy, must be concise, clear, and precise. Exact what do you want? What do you mean? Why is this so? And, and they must be anchored on the law. If the pleadings are here and there, the pleadings cannot be like an op-ed, they cannot be a disguised the submissions. Those ones will not help your case. They must be very clear. They must be anchored on the law, and the law itself must be stated on which you that gives you the right to make that pleading. In this case, a presidential election. And normally for presidential elections, they are anchored on the constitution and also the, the relevant statute. Once you have a good pleading, then it will allow you to support it with good evidence, no matter again by affidavit, because presidential petitions and other petitions are primarily ev uh, given evidence through affidavit evidence. The affidavit evidence law is a bit different from uh, pleading's law because pleading is a is a legal document, while if David is uh, an evidential document, a, a document through which you give primarily facts, you don't have to involve yourself on the law in an affidavit. You have to mention the facts as they arose and they should be relevant, all the things that the other speaker talked about. It's not a matter of picking an affidavit from every person who is supporting you. It is about picking evidence and ensure that affidavits do not contain hearsay affidavits have the relevant um, the relevant documents attached documentary proof video clips photographs where where they can be got and they are properly numbered all that is within the law again they must the affidavits themselves must comply with the law if you attach videos and photographs you would want to be sure that you can prove their authenticity you can improve their author prove their authorship and also the venue and the time when they were taken. Uh, of course, the pleading must be filed in time. Every country and has its own law on the time limitation within which to file a petition. If you dare file a petition out of time, it will be thrown, uh, thrown out. They are as strict as the ESCJ, East African Court of Justice, is strict on two months rule. So the petitions uh, must be filed within time. They Cause of action must be clear. The grounds of petition must be clear. The remedies must be clear. Now, even the remedies, not only must they be clear, they must be anchored in the law. As the court was explaining, there is a difference. To there is a difference between the remedies the court can give as a result of its general jurisdiction and the remedies the court can give as a result of handling a a presidential petition whose jurisdiction is normally circumscribed, either annulling an election, upholding an election, ordering another election, and so on and so forth. Um, you must know which pleading is for the main petition and which one is for any interlocutory remedies, mm -hmm. whether you need an additional uh, pleading, maybe a notes of motion, or you the petition is enough, and whether there is room for oral applications. I think I will end there and I will add anything that I have forgotten much later. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Kipkoge? Um, I, I would associate with the comments from my colleague from Uganda. Clarity, um, set up your course of action in a succinct manner. Uh, be clear about the remedies you are seeking. The, like for instance, in the presidential petition we just ended, uh, our constitution provides for this, the remedy you can ask for um, before, the, before the Supreme Court. So um, you cannot ask for a remedy outside what the constitution provides for, but we saw a million and one uh, 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 prayers for certain declaratory reliefs, which um, are not, are not, will not be granted because the constitution doesn't envisage. Okay. With respect to other elective positions, there could be other reliefs, but um, so clarity in terms of uh, the remedies you want to ask the court, um statutory requirements uh for the longest time our law in kenya requires the that by the result and there was by, by case law the result has been defined to mean the votes garnered by the can respective candidates who participated in the election and not merely identifying that so and so on so it it, it, it is important to pick out what does the statute and case law require in the in, in, in the pleadings. Um, and then the, the general structure of the, of, the, of the document, it must communicate. It has to be clear as to what uh, is, the, is, this, is, the, is the grievance so that the court can grant uh, relief. And then in terms of framing also, we link it to what we just discussed a short while ago is are the allegations or the environment set out in the petition uh, supported by evidence link the affidavits especially um, in the Kenyan situation I don't know the situation obtaining in other countries within the region uh, link the, the, the evidentiary material in terms of witness statements to the, uh, to the to the course of action set up in the pleadings so that you don't have a, a disjointed uh, um pleading and then the last is uh is, is, is a general structure do, do you can 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 someone make an, a good impression of you when you present that document uh to court or to the other side that also applies to the to the respondents because uh to the lawyers who may be acting for the emb or the winning candidate or any other party if it is allowed in other in in in, in other countries for third parties to participate let the response and the affidavits in support of the response answer the, the allegations raised in in with uh, uh, succinctly and with sufficient uh, clarity um that's all thank you so much mr Kipoge. Uh, we can move to Mr. Mwanza, who can maybe comment on uh, the uh, particulars of the complaints and uh, maybe the specifics in terms of the declaration sought, including we see the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Supreme Court uh, petition where there was an order of scrutiny. Maybe you can uh, comment on the specifics in terms of declaration sought and the the pleadings that are. Uh, have been set out okay so uh, i would start with first jurisdiction even before you go to pleadings now there are two sets of jurisdiction or more in election matters the first one is uh is the jurisdiction uh by depending on what your complaint is all about so there is the first uh, in, in Kenya, we have what you call pre-election disputes. So pre-election disputes are disputes that have arisen before a candidate was registered to run. And this will start from the nomination process and qualifications. If that is an issue that you need to raise, then you must raise it as a pre-election dispute before the political party, uh, internal dispute resolution mechanism, the political party dispute tribunal 
that is a court or the this the the drc the dispute resolution committee of iebc so you need to be very clear about what your complaint is because that is where the jurisdiction of the court starts now when you go to the pleadings obviously we've now done the, with the presidential petition uh, the pleadings in a presidential petition are separate and that is why probably most people made a mistake uh, in the last election cycle when they adopted the pleadings of the presidential petition now for purposes of kenya the election petition bible is the election parliamentary and county election petition rules 2017 it is available online uh, you'll find it if you go to eklr the kenya law reports you'll find it you go you click on the election uh, on, on the ele election act then on the subsidiary legislation you'd find that now that piece of legislation actually offers a comprehensive guide of what pleadings should be tendered in terms of election petitions but what is more important is uh is rule 8 and rule 10 most of the election cases 91 percent of the election cases which were filed in 2017 and 2013 were struck out based on just these two rules rule 8 speaks about contents and the form of a petition it's very simple actually it's not more than two pages and if you take your time and read it you'd see the pleadings that are required and the form in terms of the petitioners and in terms of the respondents so the first rule obviously is on time you must count your time from the date of declaration of result not gazettement those are two separate things the date that the returning officer uh, delivered uh, or issued a, a, a declaration to the winning candidate that's number one number two when you're now then that is the first one the second one is the time when that was done because it must be set out in the pleadings and the courts have said that it is a, a vital ingredient in the process now in terms of the parties so you would have the complainant then the necessary parties are will be the returning officer and the winning candidate those two must be in there in, as a respondent. If you are suing for governor, then you must have also the governor elect or the governor who has uh, been returned and the deputy governor. Those are necessary uh, parties. If you have an election uh, complaint for election violence or criminal of criminal behavior of, of agents, you must join those agents as part of the respondents so that they have a right to respond. So that is in terms of, of the parties to the, the pleadings. Then you would have the form, meaning the complaint. Uh, you must set out the result of the election. As uh, my friend Kogea said, uh, you must set the date of the declaration. That is important. And the grounds of the petition, which you are complaining about. And then the prayers. So the prayers that uh, can be granted are... are uh, in, uh, would be first uh, at an interlocutory. You, you can get a, a scrutiny, a recount, uh, or verification, or a, uh, or a, what the Supreme Court call, uh, I think it called it a production something. That's the first one. The second is obviously to, uh, the second uh, remedy that you can seek is where you have a candidate who has a who has won and they were wrongly the, the 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 second candidate was wrongly declared that under section 84 of the elections act you can ask for a retali and uh and a recount for particular uh polling stations and then have that petitioner declared as a, a winner a winner but for that you cannot complain about process or anything it has to be that single prayer you cannot imp impugn an election or impeach an election and then ask that you benefit out of it the the next one is uh, obviously a prayer for to nullification you to, to nullify a, uh, a returned candidate's uh, win and uh, and ask that uh, the electoral management body that is ibc in kenya is ordered to conduct a fresh a fresh election and lastly costs these are the major prayers that you seek uh, in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of content of an election petition but when you have find time just read the election uh, 
the election parliamentary and county election petition rules 2017 it's a it's a i mean the the entire all those rules do not run more than 10 pages and they give a concise guide about what is required of uh, a petition uh then obviously you have affidavits uh affid now evidence uh is tendered through affidavits uh mm -hmm. and and all the the rules of evidence in terms of uh of property value of about hearsay all those things apply so you must i normally tell people that when you're doing an election petition you are not like a, a gp a general practitioner doctor but you should have a certain level of uh of expertise you should know your law of evidence and uh and and i mean everything that uh it's, it's it, that is required in terms of uh drafting then um one other thing that uh is is now more and more prevalent is uh electronic evidence in terms of photos videos social media comments and things like that and you should know that uh if you are tendering evidence in electronic form you need to do a certificate that is has become more and more prevalent uh unlike maybe in the elections for 2008 and 2013 uh technology has moved pretty quickly and it's for us now to catch up and some of that evidence is quite vital in terms of uh advancing a client's case i think uh i would, I would end it at that and uh we would answer whenever questions arise Okay, thank you, Mr. Mwanza. Uh, I've seen, uh, I've heard you have touched parts of the critical, uh, the crucial points to take note uh, in affidavits and maybe witness statements. And you have indicated there that people should learn the law of evidence. Uh, maybe you can comment on the others so that uh, they can take note of the crucial points uh, in uh, when they are dealing with affidavits and witness statements as part of the pleadings. I think what is important is is for for an advocate to to obviously know their clients and know their case and base their evidence on that. You would find a lot of so avoid hearsay, have direct evidence, short and precise, and get witnesses. Mostly, the best witnesses are witnesses also who are who, are, who have a bit of learning. Uh, illiterate uh, witnesses normally uh have issues in terms of uh presenting evidence and being impeached it's very easy to to do that so you need to look out for that and then in terms of an affidavit obviously you the the, the all of us know the law of affidavits it, it sets out the, the 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 deponent their name their address the place of of live or where they stay and then now you set out the, the, the evidence and then this the jurat and the places whereby uh, the client signs or the witness, you you find that there are, there are a number of cases whereby because there are also these, there's a lot of pressure in terms of presenting a case that advocates forget to have their client sign. In fact, even the, the petition itself or, or the witness, the affidavits. So I think those are important things. Uh, if you read again the election petition rules, the way I've told you, you would see what uh, they would say about affidavits. Uh, rule 12 of those rules say uh, set out what is specifically required in terms of affidavits in support of a petition. So I think the best thing to do and to advise all of you is to read that, that piece of legislation, small piece, and it will guide you, you are at least present your client and not let uh, your, is the matter be struck out on a technicality. Thank you so much, Mr. Mwanza. Uh, as you've heard, I think we will need to go back to our readings just for general knowledge and for some who are handling the election petitions. So I would like to read the one comment before I welcome Dr. Rugemeleza. Uh, I see Alois has stated that the most critical aspect is about the law of evidence. Our judicial system is built on the perception of ability to collect and present credible evidence on the part of those on whom the burden of proof is apportioned. Such system assumes the existence of evidence as a free-flowing factor readily available to all and sundry, 
However, that by large is an ideal. Our challenge is how to ensure that we make concerted efforts to put systems in place which are transparent, credible, and accountable. The recent Kenya electoral process has to a great extent achieved the minimum threshold towards the goal, towards that goal to the extent that even Wanjiku could assess the credibility of the evidence presented. It has reduced the probability of election, electoral rigging and malpractice. The 2010 constitution has effectively granted and protected the people's sovereignty. It is a commendable milestone to which the rest of East Africa can take inspiration. Thank you so much, Alois, for the, for the good comment. We appreciate. Uh, I therefore welcome Dr. Rugemeleza to comment on the pleadings, then we can move to another area. Yeah, basically, I think uh, all that my colleagues have said uh, are quite uh, relevant, and I think it should be uh, 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 there too. It's important that uh, uh, the pleadings must state clearly the, the case, and uh, one should not just rush. Yes, the time is uh, is of essence, but uh, make sure that uh, your pleadings state clearly your, your client's case, and for that matter, you are able now to uh, to uh, even prosecute the, 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 your, your case eventually, because if the pleadings are well well drafted, it's very easy for you now to be able to litigate or prosecute your, your case during the, the, the hearing. And for us here in Tanzania, we are uh, we are guided by the National Elections Act, and uh, which basically we file our case by way of uh, a petition, which means eventually also you have to have an, an affidavit. And here in Tanzania, also you have to file, uh, make an application for security of course, whether you should be allowed not to pay or you are you are, you are, you are willing to make a, a five million uh, deposit. And it's, it's quite important. And uh, one of the cases which I, I took part in 20, 2015, uh, an, an advocate uh, saw on the on the impecuniousness of, 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 his, of his client. And uh, my, I, I basically filed an objection that uh, you are not uh, privy to the, uh, your client's uh, poverty or, or, or incapacity to make a deposit. That, that statement must be made by the, by the client himself or the, the, the petitioner. And uh, of course, the, the court uh, uh, agreed with me. So it's important that uh, it's a client who should be able to talk about that he or she being impecunious. It's not, it's not an advocate. I think this case was uh, also somewhat stated in the in the Kenyan uh, uh, the Supreme Court decision. So uh, other things must be sworn by an, by by the client, not by an advocate. An advocate can only uh, uh, swear an affidavit on matters that he or she is privy to or, or knows, and it basically took part in that. So when the and also you must understand what the law, the ground that the law uh, allows you to be able to avoid the, 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 the election. For example, here in Tanzania, your case uh, must also must be grounded on, on three grounds. That uh, the, the statement that were made during the, the elections were, 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 uh, were, were, were intended to exploit tribal, racial, or religious uh, differences or issues. And for that matter, you are trying basically to perpetrate hatred and also to discriminate a candidate or to lower the, the standing of your, your, your opponent. So some of the statements that I had in Kenya, here in Tanzania will not be allowed, but I don't know what. Uh, uh, then if perhaps the issues of, of non-compliance with the provisions of the law, and also perhaps the, the candidate at the time of, 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 of the election was not uh, was not qualified to, 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 to run as a member of, of parliament. Of course, for us in Tanzania, we don't have petitions that are for, for, on the presidential uh, part. And uh, of course, if there are some corrupt practices, and then you also, that might be uh, the, one of the, of the grounds. So the, the petition must be basically anchored into those four, four, four grounds. And now, unlike our, our, what the, our Kenyan colleague stated that, uh, you cannot ask that uh, if you are if you're impeaching the, the the election you cannot uh, also say that you should benefit out of that but here in tanzania 
uh, you might be able to say that out of those, those grounds, perhaps uh, they, you, you might be saying that, uh, 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 you might be able to say that I, I was duly elected, or I should be pronounced that I, I won that particular uh, election, but it has never, it has never happened that uh, perhaps uh, a petitioner was was removed or was de was declared not to be a winner is now declared to be a, a member of parliament. Our courts have not ventured to that extent, but it's, it's a ground that you can also also it's one of the reefs that you might be able to 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 to, to pray for. Uh, that's uh, that's what I have to say for now. Yes. Thank you, Dr. I guess the participants have taken note of. The conversation that we are, we are having, and uh, I hope you're gaining from it. Uh, so we can we can just move to the next, uh, which is the briefly on the prayers in petitions. Uh, Mr. Monzo can uh, comment uh, briefly on the prayers. Yes, thank you, thank you, Faiza. Uh, so what, one of the prayers that are available in an election. Uh, and, and I alluded this earlier on, is uh, the prayers that are set out in the Constitution. Uh, you would find the reliefs, especially if you're challenging uh, for member of National Assembly, that those are now the parliamentary seats. That would be National Assembly, uh, Senate, and uh, Women Rep. You'd find the reliefs under Article 105 of the Constitution. You'd also find that under uh, under section 74, sorry, section 75 of uh, the Elections Act, and uh, section 75, three actually provides for the reliefs that are, uh, or the prayers that you can seek in an election matter. The first under 3A is a declaration on whether or not a candidate whose election is questioned was validly elected. The second is a declaration of the candidate was uh, that a, a candidate was validly elected, and mostly when a court dismisses uh, election petitions, uh, they they declare that uh, that candidate was validly elected. Then an, an order on whether or not a fresh election ought to be conducted, and uh, and, and basically uh, scrutiny and uh, recount. And also under section 84 of the Elections Act, one of the prayers that you can seek is uh, a prayer for a declaration. It's an interesting uh, section because the court, it says that an election court may, by order, direct the commission to issue a certificate of the election to president, a member of parliament, or a member of the county assembly if, upon recount of the ballots cast, the winner is apparent and that the winner is found not to have committed an election offense. So this is one of the other remedies that are, are available, but uh, so far in, in, in our jurisdiction, we've not had any success with respect to this prayer. So I think those are majorly the prayers that are sought uh, in terms of election cases. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mwanza. I, I think that is uh, has been exhausted unless any speaker has anything to add. The prayers in a petition. Moses? Yeah, just, yeah, just one additional. And yes. under our Section 87 of the Elections Act, there could be a request to make a referral to the DPP for investigations of certain, on certain election offences. Uh, if the if the court were to find in the course of hearing an election petition that uh, election offenses were committed, then one of the remedies is to add a recommendation for prosecution by the DPP. Thank you. And uh, just it's to so correct, uh, just to correct my friend uh, Omwanza, in 2013, one of the a candidate was declared pursuant to Section 80, 80, 84. Uh, though on appeal it was overturned, so it's possible to actually utilize that section. Thank you so much, Minister Kipkoge. Kipkoge, sorry. Uh, Mr. 
So we can uh, we can just move to the service uh, because uh, we know like uh, there are different petition, there are different uh, parties to the to the petition and services needed. So we can get a comment from Mr. Kipkogei on the service of the the petitions, the pleadings, and the petition documents to the different uh, parties. Okay, th 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 thank you. Uh, um, I will just uh, provide some historical context to the question of service. Um, and I think it ties very well to the question which has been posted on the chat on the question of uh, whether absent an independent judiciary, whether it's possible to actually um, discuss, to make a, have a discussion of this nature and, and to prosecute an election petition successfully. And uh, I think the question is valid. Um, I, I think uh, the, the advocates from Kenya would remember the, the, the ignominious case of uh, Kibaki versus Moy. Um, Sorry, I think I had an outage. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I had a network outage. So under the, under the old uh, CAP7, uh, National Assembly and Presidential Elections Act, um, there was no requirement for personal service. In fact, the statute provided that service could be effected by uh, the winning candidate lodging um, an address of service with the nearest high court um, sub-registry within their facility. But then the, how the court interpreted that uh, act was to say that despite the fact that there is no requirement in law for personal service, because of the nature of election petitions and the importance of such uh, proceedings to the parties, personal service uh, is a necessary prerequisite. And that was the decision of the Court of Appeal in Kibaki versus Mui. That decision ran contrary to, I think, four other petitions which had been, or four other decisions from the same court, the Court of Appeal, in the, in the, which had been rendered by uh, other benches, um, which then led to um, petitions in 1997, 2002, all the way to 2007, being struck out for want of personal service. Um, the reaction of Kenyans to that uh, decision by the Court of Appeal then was to put it in the Constitution. So it is now provided for and codified in the Constitution that service can be personal or through any other mode, including uh, advertisement in the media or by, 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 by postal service. So um, there is greater latitude to effect service in a different uh, format. Um, including by publishing um, in the media. What you perhaps as a practitioner, you may want to be uh, to keep your, yourself abreast is to ensure that the advert you publish is meets the requirements of the rules, because there is a standard which is provided for in the rules. Uh, probably once I can clarify, is it three is it at least three centimeters by three centimeters? There is because what the challenge also which um, uh, was faced was uh, parties who published that notice in the classified section of the newspaper, a very small notice, which may not be uh, apparent, easily apparent to the contesting parties. So um, there is a standard in our law as to the size of the advertisement in the papers. But the requirement for personal service was done away with in, our, in, in the constitution itself because of its historical uh, context. Um, there is also a timeline for service, if I'm not wrong, of uh, three day, seven days upon filing, if I am not wrong. So um, yeah, that is, that's my view um, in, on, on, on that aspect. Thank you so much, Mr. Kipkoge. Dr. Nshala, you can share your comments on the service in Tanzania. I think basically our, our system here is you use the, the procedure that is provided by the civil procedure code. And basically you have to save the, 
the, the, the respondents within the time that is provided by, by the law. I think it, because the, the cases here are filed one month after, within one month from the date of the election. So, and this has to be done immediately. I think within the seven to 14 days, the service must be effected and then the other, the other side will also have to respond. You can save the the, the, the respondent personally or through the, his well-known address that might be his, his home or his office. And perhaps if he were at his, at his home, his or her home, then he, whoever, if you find any, any person residing in that, in that particular house, you might be able to make him, he or she, uh, they sign the, or receive the, 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 the documents and, and the, the summons or the, the, the office that is known. And perhaps if you encounter some difficulty, then he, you might have to go to court and ask for service by publication if that's necessary. You have to uh, show the, uh, how it has been difficult for you to effect the service personally to, to, the, to, to, the, to the respondent. And from there, once that one is effected, then you might be able to continue. But if failure to save, the candidate might put in jeopardy your, 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 your petition. So that, that's all I, I can say. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mr. Aaron, is, 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 anything that, uh, is there anything that you want to, ha to add to the conversation on service? No. Okay. Thank you perhaps, for your perhaps perhaps what I can add uh, under that this issue was raised by Moses. Yes. Is that uh, in terms of service, uh, the you cannot serve an election petition in Kenya uh, in the same way that you serve uh, summons in a, in a, in a, in a ordinary civil proceedings. Service is provided for under Rule Ten of the election petition. Uh, Rules, the one of the Bible that I've been uh, adverting to. So you, there are two modes of service. There's direct, where you get the respondents and you serve them. It's easier to serve mostly of uh, Moses clients, who are the IBC and the returning officer. But serving a winning candidate in Kenya is, is a big challenge. Uh, then there is now an advertisement that is published according to the rules in a newspaper of national circulation. So it has to either be the people, the standard or nation. And then when you are doing that, uh, you do it in form three, which is provided for in the first schedule. And the service and the, the, the dimensions are set out. At least font, the font size is 12 and uh, it is 10 by 10 centimeters. If uh, you take that to the newspaper, uh, I've done, I, I did that, I did one last week. It is, a, no, this week. <clears throat> it's a, the size is about a quarter of a page. It's a quarter of a page. Uh, so that, and then it's not in the classified uh, section of the newspaper. A newspaper of national circulation. So I think that is, uh, and the, the best way actually to serve is through advertisement than to look for these people, because you have a very short time of seven days to serve them. And if you do not, then that is a ground for dismissal. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess uh, we can we can move now to planning our time, uh, based on the fact that uh, election petitions have time limits that are short, and it's always a tedious tedious uh, activity to undertake. So I'd like you to comment on the planning of time, because I know most young lawyers maybe it's the first petition that they are handling if they have or if they are because uh, they are still being filed in court. So I can start with Mr. Kipkoge to comment on how young lawyers can plan their time when drafting these petitions. Okay, uh, interesting question. Uh, I think that the, the, the beginning point is to ask yourself, what kind of petition am I dealing with? If you by chance have to deal with a presidential petition, you know that it is seven days from the date of declaration, you are 14 days for the court to hear you, and a judgment will be rendered, which probably might, have, might not have reasons. 
and even within the 14 day period for hearing there is the time within which um which is provided for is segmented into bits you have uh, maybe probably uh 20, 48 hours to effect service of what you filed uh, and actually two hours to effect service online um 48 hours to effect service physically um on the third day the response will be coming in or is it for the fourth day and on the eighth day you have a pre-trial conference and then the hearing will follow uh, subsequently so I'm, I'm just using the presidential petition because there is a uh, the statute sets out the step-by-step -step process so within now having known the the the, the statutory and constitutional timelines which apply to the election you are dealing with then you need to plan your time accordingly let, let, let me give an example of a parliamentary election in kenya by, uh, by the, under the constitution it has to be had it has to be filed within 28 days of declaration so if you have received instructions from a parliamentary candidate who seeks to challenge the, the result or even a voter um and because you have greater latitude in terms of time for filing then it means the court will not grant you greater latitude in terms of uh, the trial itself so you have to uh, prepare concise pleadings clear pleadings so you need to give yourself a headroom within which to uh, to prepare your paperwork filing on the last day or three days before mr obatia just has just adverted to the fact that you need to publish for instance notices for service you cannot effect probably you might find yourself in a situation where you're filing last minute and you are unable to effect service within within within, within time if you are going to file on the last day you are filing online that is the day that the, 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 the online system decides to go down and you end up facing challenges in court assuming you have successfully filed you need to effect service by the way you need to discuss with your client on the question of funding because those they are not cheap you will need to pay for advertisement you have seven days within which to do that you cannot be chasing your client if you didn't pay for uh, those processes it's not it's not cheap a quarter page probably half a page might cost you something in the region of 300 to 400,000 Kenya shillings in a, in a re reputable newspaper of national circulation. If you don't have those resources, you have a challenge. Um, you then move to the next stage. Uh, judges want to conclude these cases because they are what they are described as sui generis proceedings. So the first thing you do, you might be called for pre-trial conference as soon as uh, the time for service lapses so that they can check on whether or not you've served. The, um, and, and the trial might st start in earnest. It's time consuming, it's tedious. So in terms of planning all the other exigencies, you might want to start uh, thinking about what do you do with your other files which are on the desk and other briefs you are dealing with for other clients because it might just consume your, your, your entire time. So there are several aspects to, to planning planning the litigation itself and planning your own uh, practice because it is at, at least the Kenyan experience gonna be a bit consuming. Um, if you are acting for a respondent like say IEBC, there will be other obligations, statutory obligations to deliver on. So if you've been instructed by the, by the commission, when do you intend to uh, meet the returning of support that concerned election? How what are the allegations in the pleadings, which then might require you to also meet other witnesses, the presiding officers. And again, you're doing all this racing against the time from which the court might, um, might be inclined to give and against all your other um, uh, engagements, your other clients, your other files. Uh, the courts tend to give priority to election matters because of the constitutional timeline. No judge ever wants to be accused by the country of not complying with the constitutional dictates. So they, they are more likely to put aside their work. Now you cannot tell a judge who has put aside other files that you are unable to attend court because um, you have some other files. They, they, they will not understand that at all because they also had other files, other, other judgments, other proceedings in respect to uh, probably criminal matters, commercial matters, civil matters. 
So you can't, you cannot, there would be no excuse for that. Uh, you'd have to play along. So it requires also planning your diary accordingly and planning your engagements. It could be out of town, might require you to be, uh, to also plan your personal life or now to, you, you, you're going to engage. So there's quite a, there's quite a bit, especially the Kenyan experience uh, from our end. Um, yeah, so they will be planning because the law requires you to do it, planning because the directions of the court will require you to do it, and planning because it is, it is practice. You have to look at it in that manner. Thank you. So much. Uh, Mr. Monza, you have something to add? Yes. Um, in <clears throat> election petitions, are, as, as you indicated, are tedious. And they once st they start to run, once you file, time starts to run and never stops until the court delivers the judgment. So, in terms of uh, planning time, you should also know that uh, it would affect the rest of your work, number one. Number two is that within the petition itself, the petition process, there is uh, uh, time uh, constraints in terms of responding, filing uh, uh, interlocutories, especially if you are filing uh, any other interlocutory, particularly for scrutiny and uh, recount or to put in further evidence, you need to do that before the case management conference. And if you are filing an application for Further affidavits, please annex uh, the, the affidavits so that the judge knows that you are not uh, you are not in the process of guesswork of what you want to bring in. Then also you need to know that when uh, the petition starts to be heard, it is on a day-to-day -day basis. So you need to set that uh, in your diary and uh, and also according to your office needs. If you are going for scrutiny and recount, it's a tedious process that runs for many, many hours, that also needs to be planned for. And entirely, you need to be very organized when you are prosecuting or defending an election petition. Uh, I saw also a question about uh, security for costs. Yes, you need to put security for costs. For member of national, for member of county assembly, it's 100,000. For, for anything above that, except president, it's 500,000, and it has to be, it has to be paid within 10 days from the date of filing of the petition. So I, I think I think that 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 and I guess that that is the summary of of what needs to be done. But in terms of what to look out for, uh, I would suggest uh, a few pointers. Number one is you need to familiarize yourself with election law and not just petition rules appreciate the complexity and the cumbersome nature of election petition and their sui generis nature, always are in the side of caution, join all uh, parties who are interested in the petition, including the returning officer and deputy governor, because the rules require it. If you need to use a template, uh, uh, rely on the rules, do not copy and paste from other petitions. And if you have to use another precedent, please, try and generate a petition that is as original as possible. Make your petition as comprehensive to cover all grounds that you wish to raise and the evidence that you intend to, to, to adduce. Specify specificity. State which polling stations are pro problematic. If you're seeking for scrutiny or you're attacking uh, a polling station, and sometimes it doesn't hurt to seek counsel from an experienced senior. If uh, you are stuck or, you, or your matter now goes up to the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, and it requires a bit more of uh, a technical appreciation of uh, the case and presentation to at, at the appellate stage of uh, litigation. Thank you so much, Mr. Mwanza. Uh, I, I can read one comment from the, from the chat section which states that uh, the court's language, did anyone else find it unduly harsh? Does that kind of language tell litigants that presidential election petitions are, are unwelcome? And how good is that for Kenya and the East African community? Uh, I guess, uh, uh, Dr. Avi, uh, 
if you follow the the proceedings of the Supreme Court, maybe you can comment on that. Basically, for me, what I, what I, what I, what I followed, I think, uh, I think the the proceedings were well, were well heard uh, uh, by, by by the court. Uh, I think it was uh, as even the the chair of the law sat uh, commented on that particular time. I think uh, the court went, went went out of its way even to 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 make a. To, as, to take the role of, of an inquisitor, basically to try to discern, understand other issues which perhaps are not, are not in the pleadings, but to, for the court itself to be able to uh, uh, have a clear picture of all that to, to took place. Uh, so that was a, was a, a, was a commendable, a commendable uh, 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 process. And I think perhaps it, uh, other other courts will also will do likewise. Of course, some of the comments in terms of uh, all that was found, perhaps uh, saying things were fabricated. Perhaps that one, the jury, I'll say the, the jury is out. I'm not too sure whether that was true or not. But some of the things which are said were found on the on the Kim's court on the, on the, on the Kim's uh, uh, court. I don't know the address. Perhaps that might be debated if, if some people engaged into, into fabrications or if photoshopping things, then perhaps that might be, might be a serious uh, uh, trans transgression. But I think uh, the court eventually uh, uh, lauded all the, the, the advocates that they conducted themselves well. Uh, the, the tensions were not so, so much, were not that high. But uh, perhaps some aspects might not, one might not agree with all that was decided. But I think uh, eventually, I think the verdict was quite clear that uh, perhaps the, 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 the elections were somewhat uh, well, 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 well run. And even the, the electoral commission there in Kenya of posting all the results uh, online, that uh, is a commendable step. Not many, many people have done so. And I think this is a step, I think it pushes the, the boundary uh, forward that at least we, if we're talking about transparency, we need all those information that should be, should be in public because as I said, uh, a citizen must be sure that his or her vote was counted and makes a difference. And you are respecting his or her decision. So posting the, the results online is, is very, very important. So people can do, do the math, but uh, must make sure that the integrity of the system is well protected and people can can trust it so some some other issues are left out because i think uh, some of the aspects the, the, the ibc perhaps certain things they did not uh, conduct them they did they not acquit themselves well uh, you can see the division within the the, the commission uh, but uh, as uh, we are we're still awaiting for the decision of sorry the, the final re the, the reason the judgment of the of the court might be also to pick up some other aspects where ibc must uh, be uh, reformed to ensure that uh, eventually the elections are well are well run, are credible and trusted by each and every uh, participant. Uh, so that, that's what I can say. Thank you so much, Dr. Tari. Uh, I I can read another another question. Uh, kindly, what are your views on the timeline within which the presidential petition is to be determined? Uh, given the voluminous uh, nature of the petition, don't you think don't you think the 14 days is too short given the first seven days are spent for exchanging of pleadings and rest and uh, exchanging of pleadings and responses should we amend the law to 21 days at least? Uh, I guess any either Mr. Omonzo or Mr. Kipkoge can answer that or, or Mr. Aaron? Uh, yes, I, I don't think that's too short because uh, of the of the nature of the dispute in terms of presidential elections. I think that matter should be determined as quickly as possible. Reason being that first is that these timelines are set out in the constitution. So the only way you can change them is to do a constitutional review. Uh, and to change them. Number two is because once you file a petition, then the president-elect cannot be sworn. 
so you you stop the processes of governance and they cannot move forward uh, until that petition is heard and determined thirdly this has been the third cycle of uh, presidential petitions since the 10, 10, 10, uh, 2010 uh, constitution and although in all of them the courts have been able to handle them the advocates have been able to prosecute and defend and I think uh, we matured in terms of how we are able to respond and deal with this matter. So I, I would think, I would suggest that uh, time remains as it is because of the implication of extending it. It means that you are uh, protracting the, 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 the sort of the contestations in court because that debate is never settled you you leave the country in in, uh, in doubt and also sometimes in a lot of uh, uh, anxiety i've also seen somebody post a question about whether you can uh, whether rule order 5 rule 22b of the uh, of the civil procedure rules apply no they do not please election petitions are sui generis and as i said the bible of election petitions is uh, the election petition County and Parliamentary Rules 2017, in terms of service and in terms of everything. Courts have said that have ruled in many, many decisions that uh, the civil procedure is not applicable in election cases. Thank you so much, Mr. Mwanza. Before you mute your mic, uh, tied to the previous question is also, don't you think that uh, once a petition has been filed, disputing the presidential outcome should in, should in itself serve as a stay of the declaration of the results and the declared winner revert to the presidential candidate, just like the losers instead of uh, being the president-elect. My view is that by the fact that the declared winner raises to be the president-elect status in itself is intimidating to the court and hence the court may end up rendering a decision of the president-elect. Maybe you can comment on that person's opinion. Yeah, just two, two, two issues. Number one is once a petition has been filed, then the, the process of taking over governance or taking over assum uh, in the assumption of office of the president-elect is stopped until the matter is heard and determined. So I think that is addressed. Secondly, once a president is elect, then he has to be a president-elect because a petition is a petition to challenge the decision of the return. You cannot have something in limbo. And uh, thirdly is that in 2017, our courts actually nullified, the Supreme Court nullified the, the, the result that, uh, that returned uh, Uru Kenyatta as president. And remember, he was defending. He was not, he was not uh, it was not, not a new term similar to what is happening right now. So I think our courts are above that. They've shown independence and the temerity at least to deal with the presidential petitions. And uh, I would suggest that the law as it is currently serves our purpose and, uh, and uh, our structure of governance. Thank you, Mr. Mwanza. Uh, I see Zainab's hand is up. So maybe if you have a question, you can raise it. Zainab A32. Okay. So maybe if I may ask, uh, uh, if uh, maybe service is, uh, is affected to an agent who has no authority, can it be deemed as to have been affected? No, it will not. Even in the civil, in the civil law, it, it, it cannot. So service, can only be affected to the person or to an authorized agent. Okay. Thank you. I let me just check if there's any other question. Uh, uh, there is one question from uh, Bobby Asiani. Kindly give an analysis on how pragmatic it is that the petitioners in the Raila three petition went to great lengths to establish their case based on submitted evidence, e.g. the Kim's kit, discovery of uploaded forms, and also Senator Omtata's calculations on the IBC totals, 
also a Kiliwili Sotieno analysis of the irregularities in the registrar's report, which showed problems with Form 34S. Yet, in spite of all this evidence, the court, in its wisdom, moved forward to dismiss the whole petition. Why did it not allow one ground to succeed out of nine instead of outright dismissal? There's public shock on, it, on this issue. So maybe Ad Advocate Kipkoge can comment on that. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Faiza. Um, I, I, I think uh, the, the court uh, operates, um, and I, I'm sure counsel, the counsel who is asking the question knows this, operates on the basis of evidence and the material presented um a note on sentiment it would have been the easiest thing for the court to allow one so that but if there is no material which supports the grant of such a relief then it would be a tragedy if the court was to say let me just allow one one ground on the basis of uh, sentiment but um in terms of the material which was presented i think um, we all have the judgment, at least the, the, the summary which has been shared by the court. It is, it, it is important that we go through it, uh, appraise ourselves on the reason why, for instance, Omtata's argument on the, the calculation for voter turnout was wrong. Um, um, Omtata had operated on the basis that the percentages, the, the, the percentage garnered by the uh president elect was or at least uh, as declared by the chair of iebc was higher than it truly was which when uh, corrected based on the statement which had been given by the chair of iebc was found not to be true so that the correct note was 64.7 and not 65.4 as had been pleaded by omtata uh with respect to the other material which was presented um if you read the judgment you will notice that um the court was able to discount based on the material which was presented by iebc uh that some of that material was not uh genuine and that is probably why uh, some of the advocates were admonished because it would have been better if it had been presented by persons who claimed to have sourced them than being presented by an advocate and then it turned out not to be genuine. So when one correlated, for instance, forms from certain constituencies with those which were presented by the commission and which were on the portal, it turned out that some of those forms were, um, and the, the court used the language of forgeries. And if it's a forgery, it's a forgery. It really, you cannot, I don't know whether you can find a substitute for such for 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 that document. It's a forgery. It's a forgery. It's fake. It's fake. So I think it's really on the basis of the analysis of the actual documentation, um, the logs which were presented, for instance, which were established to have been actually actually it was admitted by the witness concerned that it did not relate to that election. So. An, an analysis of the material which was before the judges leads to only one and only one conclusion that there was no sufficient evidence to support a finding in favor of the petitioners. Um, probably I'm, I'm conflicted. <laughs> I shouldn't be answering this question because I, we, our firm represented the IEBC. So probably someone else, a third party, should look at that material and ask whether the court arrived at that at the correct finding. But we take the view that um, the, that material was not necessarily correct. Thank you, Mr. Kipkoge. Anyone, any, any other speaker was a different answer? Uh, 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 on my part, I think, uh, yeah, uh, it's important that uh, in terms of the time, for me, I'll just go and say 14 days is not a sufficient period. Uh, I think 21, even uh, two, uh, four weeks would have been fine. Much as I know you are talking about uh, 
uh, uh, the country is staying in, in limbo, but it's not in limbo in that because you have an incumbent president who's supposed to uh, eventually leave office. So like in the Kenyan situation now, Uhuru is able to continue much as easy as he, he cannot make a appointments during that particular particular time when the election is supposed to, to take place or during the, 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 the after, if, even if the, the, the judgment is, is, is issued, it's still in the, perhaps an, uh, an election, a fresh election is ordered, you still have the, 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 the president uh, uh, controlling the, 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 the country, so it's still in charge. And it's important that the period, in, in order for, to, for us to make sure that we are, we are confident of the people who are uh, running uh, our respective countries, we must make sure that indeed they got in that particular position without any, uh, uh, without uh, uh, conducting themselves illegally or in such a manner that perhaps uh, some doubt must, must be cast on their assumption of, of office. So we must make sure that the process is so uh, transparent and uh, that the, the, all the processes of ensuring that uh, that particular person was indeed elected uh, 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 are followed. So ample time is required. Yes, we might even say, oh, but in the other cases, we take even two or three, four years to do that. But I think uh, 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 four weeks or, or, or a month is a sufficient period to be able to, to hear and determine that particular petition. And as you can see, the voluminous nature of the, the evidence that's supposed to be presented. And I think it's very, very important that uh, that time is extended. Of course, for the Kenyan constitution, uh, for the Kenyan side, even Uganda, you might need to amend your respective uh, constitutions to allow for, uh, for that, that that amount of time. As as, as it is, okay, that, that's what the the, the the two constitutions say. Say you don't, you, you can't do much. You have to operate within the, the limits, the time limits that have been stated by those uh, constitutions. But I think uh, if one is to go and say an uh, amendments should be made. That would be my 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 recommendation, and uh, for that matter, uh, it's something that we should be able to do. Otherwise, the, the courts, uh, the court, the court in Kenya, unlike the one in Uganda, because in Uganda the, the, the Supreme Court there has has consistently been, been divided. Uh, the, the decisions have been like, like three to two, uh, three to, to one, uh, or four four sorry four four to one. So there has been a, a unanimous judgment there, but then some of the judges who tried to differ in Uganda, I think, ended up on the on the on the wrong side. But I think in Kenya things have been have been okay, and so long as we have a unanimous uh, decision, perhaps one can go and say, okay, that's the decision. We should be able to respect it, and if there are issues that perhaps we think they are not well addressed. Those should be should be people should be able to campaign and make sure that perhaps the necessary changes are made. Even the the Supreme Court itself said there are things that have to be uh, uh, changed within the IEBC because perhaps they don't engender uh, confidence uh, because they say in Kenya it has been now become a tradition that uh, perhaps IEBC is not trusted. And so how can we ensure that we have a trusted institution? I think it might be a work in progress, but a work in progress that has, has to be done quickly. Otherwise, we don't want to have the, the carnage of that, that took place in 2007, 2008. We don't want a repeat of that. Uh, so as much as the Kenyans might pat themselves in the back, you might pat yourself in your backs, but I think I would say it's still a work in progress, but a work in progress that, that has to be done quickly to ensure that we have a well-functioning electoral process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mr. Aaron, you have something to add? I want us to finalize it now for 10. Mr. Aaron? Uh, he dropped out. Okay. So we still have questions in the chat. I guess I can pick them up with the respective speakers uh, from the after the meeting, then I can answer to the participants. Uh, I, I therefore want to give uh, each uh, each uh, speaker 
one minute to conclude and uh, give encouraging words to the young lawyers and any point to take home. So I start with Dr. Tari. Uh, for me, I'll just say thank you for the opportunity. I think for young lawyers, basically, I'll say we should take this uh, election cases serious. It's a process that uh, uh, we are trying to make sure that whoever assumes office in our respective countries uh, is, 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 uh, is duly elected, not by manipulation or by intimidation. And we should take our, 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 our duty of filing or representing our respective clients before the courts of law seriously. And for that matter, whichever case, whenever a client approaches you, you should, you should try as much as possible to ensure that you have a credible case. If he or she doesn't have a credible case, try to dissuade or discourage him from filing that particular case. Much as you might want to uh, have uh, food on, on your table, but if it's a frivolous case, please don't try to file one or be part, be part of it because it's a serious end, uh, undertaking and uh, most of the people will be uh, following that particular case and you don't want to be uh, part of, of, the pro of the case, which is, is somewhat frivolous, even for yourself when you look at it, you think that you don't have, your client doesn't have a case. But otherwise, if he or she has a genuine case, please make sure that you prepare your pleadings very well and you are able to argue that particular case and advance the erection to the jurisprudence. So that might also eventually might be able to look back and say, really a good case and you, you, you won it. You won for your client or even if you, you lost, but at least you, you push the, 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 the jurisprudence forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mwanza? Just encourage, sorry, I, I would just encourage young advocates to, whenever they have these instructions, to venture and uh, believe in themselves, work hard like in all the other cases. Uh, I remember the first time I did uh, an election matter and I succeeded, I was, uh, I was a young lawyer. I think I was about 26, 27 years. Dear, dear, dear. So I would uh, I would encourage therefore young lawyers to whenever they get uh, these sort of uh, instructions, they they check them. Secondly, is that uh, election cases are demanding in terms of time, intellect, uh, pressure from clients, and they also have you know other other subterranean uh, issues like. Uh, intimidation and things like that. So you need to be very aware of that. And uh, thirdly is that, uh, as uh, Dr. Taria said, uh, this is part of our governance. And uh, every time an election petition has been filed, whether, it has, whether it's been dismissed or it's overturned an election, it has contributed to the jurisprudence in this area and effectively helped the IEBC, that is the electoral management body, to manage the affairs of, uh, of of the elections, and uh, in fact, uh, one of the cases that was very important, the Raila 2017, which have clarified the way an election is conducted, and uh, you could uh, give a call to IBC and how it conducted the elections for this cycle. And and I think that is uh, my take home. Thank you so much. Uh, finally, Mr. Kipkoge. Uh, thank you, Fausa. I think uh, for young lawyers, um, election law practice is uh, exciting. It's interesting. Um, it's a unique space. It's a confluence between politics, uh, constitutional law, um, and all the other substantive areas of law. Um, if you choose elections field as a to specialize there. Um, it is it's also rewarding in terms of peace <laughs> so it, it's it's uh, you may want to give it a try um under one um it, it, it tests you uh, all the things you learned in law school past and from the evidence law to criminal law it transcends all the other practice areas so um it's worth giving it a try for those of you who want to file petitions in Kenya, you have another three days to go. 
um, depending on your electoral area, I think Nairobi should be the last, uh, Nairobi County governor should be the last, I think it was declared way after the presidential petition. But it's, it's, a bit, it's, a, it's exciting and I would encourage you to do it. I started it with, in my first year post admission when I was employed in the now defunct Electoral Commission of Kenya. And uh, up to now I'm still in it. So um, you have enjoyed the ride. Welcome to this space for those of you who are interested and we are available to, 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 to work together across the region really. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Kipkoge. Uh, I want to welcome my colleagues now to give their conclusions. Mokua. Hey, good uh, afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, speakers. Uh, I think Mr. Mwanza uh, uh, forgot to say that he's my mentor, but uh, I have forgiven him. So thank you, the Daktari. Thank you, the speakers from Tanzania and uh, from Rwanda and uh, from uh, Uganda for accepting to, to be part of us this afternoon. And uh, I really thank you for sacrificing your time, Mr. Kifoge, Mr. Mwanza. And we continue, as we as young adults, we continue looking up upon you to give us guidance as well as to mentor us in this very new and uh, challenging area of law. But we admit it is exciting. And we, we endeavor to learn the most from you as we also take over the mantle in the next years. Thank you and uh, back to you in studio. <laughs> Thank you, Mokua. Brenda? Yes, uh, Mokua said everything, so I won't repeat. Uh, mine is to just uh, welcome you. We have webinars for the Young Lawyers Committee, the Young Lawyers uh, Committee of the East African Law Society conducts webinar, monthly webinars on various topics of law, and we welcome you for our sessions. We also want to welcome you for the East African Law Society Annual General Meeting Conference which will take place from 23rd to 26th of November. And the theme is fostering East African unity and diversity in a globalized practice environment. You're welcome to attend as an attendee, as a speaker. Uh, I'm sure some of you have received the, if you're on our mailing list, you have already received the conference booklet, but I'm so sure they will also share the same after this webinar, so karibuni sana. And with that, I think we are done. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, Brenda. So finally, I thank the Mr. Kipkoge, Mr. Mwanza, Daktari for creating time for us. Uh, we have really benefited from the conversations and I hope the young lawyers have taken up something home that uh, will guide them through the drafting of the election petition and handling the same. On behalf of the East Africa Law Society Young Lawyers Committee, we appreciate the participants and the speakers for taking their time out of their busy schedules to be with us and uh, we don't take it for granted. So thank you so much and uh, have a great, have a great evening and till next time, we can meet again. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.